So now it is my pleasure to invite up our first panel of speakers. Their goal will be to help you take political stock of the Common Core, including what the midterm elections mean for the future. We've got a really strong lineup this morning. I'll give them a minute to settle in. We've Michael Brickman is the National Policy Director at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, where he is a commentator on education reform issues and is a regular contributor to the Flypaper blog and other publications. Next is Carol Burris. She's principal of Southside High School in Rockville Center, New York, and often comments on education politics, including as a guest blogger on the Washington Post Answer Sheet blog. Carmel Martin is the Executive Vice President for Policy at the Center for American Progress, as well as a former Assistant Secretary for Planning, Evaluation, and Policy Development at the U.S. Department of Education under Secretary Arne Duncan. Michael McShane, finally, is a research fellow in education policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute, and he's the author or editor or co-editor of, I believe it's four recent books on education policy. Um, he's also a former high school teacher. And keeping our speakers on speaking terms will be our moderator, um, Andrew Ujifuza, who has been distinguishing himself with his coverage of Common Core um, at Education Week. And if you're not already following his blog, State Ed Watch, he tracks uh, politics and policy across the 50 states. I recommend that you start doing so. With that, I'll say, one more time that I'm delighted that you could join us, and I'll turn it over to Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, thank you for the kind words. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, so I was thinking about this event last night and, and a recent holiday we had, and I was thinking that the Common Core is um, it's almost in the rarefied position in politics where you can get into an argument about it with your uncle over the Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner table. It's it's it may have actually reached that point, so um, kind of appropriate that we're kind of setting the scene for today with uh, talking about the politics of it and where it stands. Um, so I think it might be helpful just to set the stage with a few numbers because you know I get asked about this sometimes in terms of state adoptions and just sort of to get those out of the way for folks because we get asked about that sometimes. Uh, right now, uh, we have it that 43 states in the District of Columbia are Common Core adopters, uh, and we have three states that have either repealed the standards or are bound to do so under law. And we also have, I believe, um, three states um, that are officially reviewing the standards uh, in some capacity. Um, the other numbers I would throw out there are the tests, um, and I would just point out that we have from Ed Week here also, Catherine Gerwitz, who covers a lot of the testing issues, and if I get any of my numbers wrong, I'm sure she'll correct me very quickly. <laughs> um, but I believe the tally right now is that for the 2014-15 school year, um, 18 states plan to use Smarter Balanced, nine plan to use PARC along with DC, um, three are uncertain or undecided, and 16 um, are using some other kind of test uh, for the Common Core other than PARC or Smarter Balanced. Um, and keep in mind that some states may not be using those federal consortia tests, Parker Smarter Balance, for all grades. Um, you might have a, a split there in terms of which grades they're using, which tests for. Um, so I think we're at a point in the Common Core debate where the, I, I think the, the politics of it have become pretty clear. Um, and I, I think a lot of the argument um, is ultimately about sort of how we view schools and what we view the purpose of schools to be. I think if you if you follow the debates, that's sort of what it comes down to in, in a lot of cases. I think for Common Core supporters, I think um, one of the primary reasons for supporting it is that they view the Common Core as a, a means to an end and, and looking at the goal of schools, a major goal of schools, to produce um, productive, highly skilled workers and, and citizens in, in the context of the U.S. economy and on a global stage. Um, and, and I think that 
um, uh, partisans on, on both sides of the spectrum who are critics of the Common Core, I think, take issue with that uh, in some way, whether um, uh, you have some folks who are suspicious of the federal government's role uh, in Common Core um, or folks who think that it's being used to unfairly characterize um, and punish even um, students, schools, and uh, teachers in particular. So I think that's the, the, the rough outline of sort of where we are in terms of the debate. And I will stop jabbering for now and get to my first question for you guys, which is, you know, I think folks are interested in what we've had the 2014 elections, which you may think had some impact on the Common Core debate, maybe not. Um, but wh where do you guys see the momentum in terms of, you know, do you think that the Common Core is basically set and folks and supporters don't need to worry? Or do you think that momentum is really on the side, is going to be on the side of critics in 2015? And sort of what's, what's your evidence for, for feeling that way in terms of who has, who has the momentum? So maybe we can just go down the line and Mike, we can start with you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so this is something that I think has become an issue where there's really kind of a divide between the political side of this and the policy side of this. So on the political side of this, clearly there's a divide. Clearly there are, there's one side that supports Common Core and there's one side that opposes Common Core. But I think once you take it a step deeper and you look at the actual policies that are being passed, really in any place where a Common, common Core bill has been passed, with the exception of Oklahoma, you see a situation where I think, especially on the conservative side, and these are mostly conservative states that are passing these bills and really offering these bills, with the exception of Oklahoma, these bills have not really generated a lot of division between conservative Common Core supporters and conservative Common Core opponents. There's actually a lot of agreement on once you get past the politics, once you get past the arguing about the history of the Common Core, who's really in control of this, where did it come from, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Once you actually look at the policy of, okay, so what do we think we should do about this? There really is a lot of agreement at the state level and at the federal level in terms of let's get the federal government out of this. Let's make sure there's not a federal role for certainly uh, coercing states, but even to incentivize states to adopt any set of standards. And at the state level, I think there's universal agreement that we need high college and career ready standards and that we need um, a set of standards that is determined by states. I think conservatives across the board agree on those principles. And while there might be different bills, kind of different flavors of that agreement passed in states over uh, the next year or so, and to be clear, there will be bills passed in states. I think what's really interesting to look at is not the rhetoric, not who's declaring this a repeal, who's not declaring this a repeal, um, but to look at what the actual policy does and where the agreement or disagreement is uh, among conservatives in these conservative states. Thanks, Mike. I agree in large part with Michael, but I think there's a liberal story that's there as well and a progressive story. Um, let's think about New York. We just had an election for governor, right? He, he had a contender in the primary. Her name was Zephyr Teachout. And she managed to capture over 35% of the vote. One of her primary issues and the, groups, the group that she most courted were teachers. And she made a big deal in her opposition to the Common Core, evaluating teachers by test scores, and what has been known in New York as the region's reform agenda. Well, she didn't prevail, but then the election happened. And Howie Hawkins, the Green candidate, took up most of that support. Now in 2011, he captured 1.3% of the vote. This time he captured 5% of the vote. So there is not only conservative pushback, but progressive pushback. Now 5% of the vote may say it's nothing. Well, if it were a close election, that 5% of the vote would have been significant. And what we're seeing, I believe, in the Democratic Party is that there are a split on some of these issues. And it's not a, you know, a belief that people don't think there should be high standards or that we shouldn't make kids college and career ready. Of course, uh, the majority of Americans, I think, believe that, and the majority of progressives. 
It's a matter of whether or not these standards are the best standards, and then all of the other stuff that has been inter intertwined with the Common Core standards, what kind of effects are they having on public schools? So I think it's going to be a, a very interesting uh, story to follow. I think it will impact primaries um, in the Democratic Party as well as in the Republic, Republican Party. And I think really at this point, Common Core is on the downside. It's going to be slowly taken apart bit by bit in the states. You foreshadowed one of my questions very nicely, <laughs> but Michael, why don't you sure. go ahead? Well, since we, I, I guess I've already taken the entire political spectrum, that doesn't give mu us much left to talk about. <laughs> but um, yeah, the left and the right. So, so uh, to not um, try and repeat what's already said, I think one sort of interesting question moving forward when we talk about this sort of momentum, what is momentum on the side of critics or is it uh, on the side of supporters, is we have to start asking ourselves, like, what does it mean to be a part of the common core? Right, so as Andrew said at the beginning, um, you know, 43 states still nominally say, and the District of Columbia say that they are part of the Common Core, um, uh, while some are, you know, others are reviewing others. But uh, only 27 are using uh, the state consortia, or the two multi-state consortia. So putting the sort of common in the Common Core, right? So the other the other states that are choosing to create their own tests that are aligned to the standards, um, even states within those consortia, how cut scores and other things are set. And there's a really serious question of what does it mean to be part of the Common Core? How much do you have to do in common with your neighbors to say that you're part of this coalition? I mean, to my mind, if a state is using its own tests, setting its own cut scores, using its own materials, that common part of the Common Core really isn't there, right? Maybe the core part is there. But I don't know if the common part is still there. So, so the question I think moving forward is um, in states where there's been pushback, where there's been criticism, what does it mean to be part of the Common Core? Can you nominally be part of the effort by saying that we're aligned to the Common Core? Maybe you've renamed the standards to, what are they, the Arizona Sunshine Standards or something like that where they're mostly uh, <laughs> mostly aligned but different. So so that's, that's, I think, the interesting sort of tension moving forward. Maybe states keep it uh, in name with slight tweaks but kind of go their own way. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, I think we did a, uh, Ed Week did something where we looked at, at Park and Smarter Balance, the two tests that got uh, federal money, and I think we showed that the majority of students will not be taking those tests uh, in 2014-15, which is um, sort of a, it's, it's a big change from where people might have thought things were going a couple of years ago, so. Yeah, I guess I would say um, I do think that on the right, the, the source of controversy around the Common Core did stem from the appropriate role or inappropriate role of the federal government. But I do think you see in most of those states, again, probably with the exception of Oklahoma, at the end of the day, when conservative politicians said, well, what's best for our kids? They ended up with something that's very close to the Common Core, or they kept the Common Core. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with a review process of standards. That's completely legitimate. That's what we should do in education as a matter of course. Um, so I guess I would say on the right, I think we're on an up, you know, stabilized. I think there's still controversy there, but I think people realize that that, I think there was a lot of political opportunism with respect to the Common Core, and I think that that will stabilize the longer people start working with the standards as they get implemented in schools and, you know, it, people see the value for their education, see the fact that it opens up opportunities for teachers to engage in collaborative learning and project-based learning. That's what teachers want to do. That's what kids want to do. So I think that that side of the equation will hopefully stabilize. On the left, I, I couldn't disagree more with Carol. I mean, I, I, I think we saw in this last election cycle that a lot of people uh, tried to make the Common Core a campaign issue, and by and large, uh, it, it wasn't an issue. It wasn't the thing that was the decider in an election cycle. I also think, again, on the left, there's legit the the controversy stems with 
conflating the standards with testing, use of tests. I think the, the debate around use of tests is going to continue and be a debate that we have to navigate through. But I think by, by and large on the left, people believe that students should be held to college and career ready standards. Right now, the Common Core is the best thing we have in that regard. And I think uh, when push comes to shove, educators, the more they have exposure to, to the standards, they see the progress in places like Kentucky where they doubled college and career readiness um, uh, among high school graduates, I think people will, it, it, the opposite, that it will, um, the, the traction against the standards will decrease um, and will work through the issues, the thorny issues of implementation and testing. So there's a, a, a joke that I'm thinking of here. It's when, when you're having an argument with your spouse, whatever you're having an argument about, it's really about something else, your argument. And so <laughs> I, I wonder, that both Carol and Carmel mentioned this, I, I wonder to what extent you guys feel as though the argument about the, the Common Core is really about everything else in public education that people find controversial and, and that the Common Core has become a very useful way to argue about testing, to argue about accountability, to, to argue about things that uh, or, or the federal role in education, um, r rightly or wrongly. I, I, just, I just wonder about that a lot, especially since for much of the public, it, it's hard for them to get a sense of what the Common Core is in, in some respects. Um, most people haven't read the standards, and um, even Arne Duncan jokes about how, you know, just if you're having trouble sleeping, open up the standards, have a glass of wine, and then you'll be fine. Um, so to, to what extent do you guys feel that, that the argument about standards is really an argument about other things? Who wants to take that one? Yeah, I guess I'll start. Um, hmm. So is the Common Core a proxy for lots of other things with corporate reform? 70%, um, 75% of that is, I think, accurate. Um, it, it comes, it came in a package, <laughs> that package being called Race to the Top that did a lot of change that felt like shotgun change to schools. Um, it's tied up with feelings about charter schools. It's tied up with feelings about teacher tenure. So yes, th there is a lot of stuff. And just testing and the, the high stakes nature of testing, which seems to be out of control to a lot of teachers and a lot of parents. Um, but I, th I think that there is also genuine concern about the quality of the standards themselves. I mean, if you, if you look at the state of New York, which has been on an implementation road now of, I don't know, probably about four years, um, the popularity of the Common Core standards with teachers have dropped. It's, it's gone lopsided. It's gone from majority approval to majority disapproval. Same thing happened in California. We also see some national polls, with the exception of Bill Gates' poll, um, that also show the same thing. So we're not seeing in the polls teachers liking the standards more. Um, certainly that's not the case with parents, especially with mathematics. Um, and, you, and you know, there's, there's also then, you know, what do we know about the standards? What effect have they had? I mean, it was an interesting statistic that Carmel shared, but the truth of the matter is, the kids that she's talking about were never exposed to the Common Core standards, right? So she's talking about data or about college readiness. Um, I believe it's the ACT data, but those weren't kids that went through the system of the Common Core. We're not going to really see the effects of the Common Core for probably another one or two years out when we take a look at NAEP scores. Um, so while having all of the other pieces certainly became problematic for the Common Core, I think in and of itself it would have been problematic anyway. You know, I, I would say that part of the, the reason that Common Core can get tied to all of these other issues is because the Common Core is actually related to a lot of these other issues. So when you talk about school accountability, the, those are the standards to which the schools are judged. So the Common Core is sort of uh, bound to the teacher evaluation, even things around technology policy or school choice or others. If you think about some of the other issues that have been controversial, they might only affect a small subset of students. So if you're talking about charter schools, it's predominantly an urban phenomenon. We're still talking about only five, perhaps 10% of students that, that we're really talking about there. Whereas the Common Core undergirds 
so many other things. So, so goes the Common Core, so goes those other things. And so it can get tied into, if you don't like teacher evaluation, well, the teachers are being val evaluated based on how well they teach the Common Core. So the Common Core is tied in. If you don't like school accountability, well, school accountability is tied into the Common Core. So I think that's why it's all been sort of drawn together. Do you think, though, it's supercharged discussions about those issues in a way that maybe people didn't have an interest in them before? Yeah, I mean, I agree that obviously I, I, on a policy level they are tied in, but do you think, do you think it has supercharged things? Sure. Well, I think, I don't know if supercharged is the word I would use, but I, I agree that, that the standards themselves were likely to create some level of controversy, but I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we basically asked that in these 44 states, they were asking the education system to dramatically raise the level of instruction that was being provided to kids. It requires a huge shift in not just um, the teachers learning new content, but learning new instructional um, techniques like project-based learning, teaching your kids to be analytical thinkers and problem solvers, not just to memorize math equations, but to understand math concepts. So that's, that's, that, that was always going to be very hard and going to take a huge amount of resources and effort to do. So it's not that surprising that when the, when the rubber hit the road that there was some level of controversy around it. I do think there was a conflation with things like the, the, the controversy around testing for the reasons that you said. But I, I also think we should just appreciate that I, I believe that Raising the level of standards, college and career readiness is this, is the single most important thing we can do for our for the future generations, and it is going to have incredible um, in positive impact on our children moving forward and prepare them for a 21st century economy. A change like that, understandably, wasn't going to be easy and was going to create controversy in the implementation. I think it was more controversial than it needed to be because I think too many states didn't do what they needed to do to effectively implement the standards around professional development, development of, of instructional materials. They could have done a much better job on that. Hopefully, moving forward, they will, but I think that created more controversy than we really needed. Mike, does that sound right to you? or? Yeah, I think on uh, on a lot of levels it does. And to get back to your question and, and sort of kind of address Mike's point, you know, there's no one out there that I've met at least on the left who says, you know, I was really in favor of high stakes testing, but then I read the Common Core standards and now I'm not. There's no one on the right who said, you know, I really believed in a strong role for the federal government when it comes to education, but then I read the standards and, and now I don't. <laughs> the Common Core has not changed anybody's opinion on some of these core educational issues that we're talking about. And that's why I think to your question, absolutely. This is all about these other issues. Um, and again, it goes back to the first point I made on your first question, which is the policy here has almost nothing to do with the actual standards. And I think, um, especially on the right, but, in, but even on the left, there is strong agreement uh, for high standards, even though they might, necessar they might not necessarily be called the common core, which I would argue doesn't matter in the first place, because before we were all paying attention to this, there were states like Pennsylvania that made serious changes to their standards. There were states, uh, I think Florida changed the name way back before there was any kind of controversy on the Common Core. So I think that there's uh, there's some of these things that are going on and it is in a much more politically charged environment, but I think that really does ultimately have to do with these other issues with the possible exception of the fact that, you know, the reason, sometimes we ask, well, why, why on earth do these states have these terrible, really low level standards before the Common Core? And the reason was, it was the politically advantageous thing to do because you could tell everybody that all the kids were doing great when they weren't. And so there is, if that was the politically easy thing to do, that means that this is the politically tough thing to do. And it's, that's, that is a challenge. It is going to be a challenge when states had 80% of their students proficient in reading and now it's 40%. That's going to require explaining and it's gonna require uh, that political capital be expended to defend the fact that we're gonna to move to higher, more rigorous standards for kids. I mean, do you folks think states have done a good job of explaining that? You, you mentioned about how um, this is a big shift that, that states are going to have to explain to the public. 
And I think everyone is looking towards the spring and summer when students take, in most states, take these new assessments and, and then the scores come out. And I think everyone says, okay, that's sort of a key inflection point. Have states, it's, it's sort of like building an orchid in a way because you have to, you know, explain to the public and gender public trust. That's hard to do. It's, it's not straightforward. You can't do it through policy. Um, like Carmel, for example, you said you were concerned that states, you know, have done an uneven job of implementation. Uh, does it extend to that issue as well in terms of public trust and what the public knows about and expects? Yeah, I think that has a huge impact on um, parent, parents and teachers' view of the standards, and understandably so. I mean, I think there was too much of, okay, here are the new standards, go do it, when really standards are just the beginning. You have to translate that into instructional materials, curriculum, that most of that happens at the state and local level. Um, professional development for teachers. I think a lot of that is where you saw the the, uh, the controversy coming and, and this backlash towards the label of Common Core. But I think, I think as time passes, I, I mean, I see that in my own children's school uh, here locally where the first year was very rough and then the second year, you know, my daughter's algebra teacher's like, I really like it. At first I was very worried about it. So, you know, I think with the passage of time, some of that will dissipate, hopefully because state and local actors will do a better job of explaining the standards to parents and to teachers and helping teachers uh, have the tools that they need to translate them into effective instruction. Do you guys think it's too late? Or? <laughs> well, I, I I'd like to almost go back to the beginning of the question. Are these cut scores reasonable cut scores to define grade level? Are they? We just assume they are. We are assume kids were doing terribly, right? I mean, so there is this assumption that they have set the cuts at exactly the right place. Well, in New York, where the cut was set was in alignment with the 1630 on the SAT. I, mean, I can show you the document where they did it. Is that reasonable? Is that what proficiency should actually be? Proficiency on NAEP was never meant to mean grade level. Oh, and and you, you all can, can dig into that yourselves and look at, you know, so many people have made that point. In and of themselves, will standards make a difference? That's another question to ask. So we had in 2013, three states, right, participate in PISA. Connecticut, Florida, and Massachusetts. Massachusetts standards according to Fordham were high. Florida's standards, these are former standards according to Fordham, were rated very high. Connecticut, bump, right down at the bottom. In terms of the rating of standards, what happened on PISA? Massachusetts and Connecticut were way up there with the highest performing nations. Florida, way down at the bottom. Uh, Tom Loveless talks about this a lot. Do standards even really make a difference? You know, so what kind of does make a difference maybe is if you match standards with tests. But then again, is the cut score reasonable? I would argue in New York it wasn't. And that a lot of the measurement that we have with so many kids in the lowest performing band of one is really just, it's almost multiple guess, right? So all of these issues are very complicated at the core, and I think that we make a lot of assumptions. We make assumptions that harder is better, and that if we make everything harder, kids will learn more. I'm not quite so sure that that's the case. Do we even have a sense, Mike, of how uneven or even implementation is across states? Is, is, do we have one big piece of paper we can slap down and say, this is how it's going? You know, with, with all of those related issues? I mean, I think some, some organizations are trying to get to the bottom of that right now. So I think we have anecdotal evidence. There's been a lot of great right. reporting yeah. that's been done of going in and spending time in schools and others. But, but from that a sort of systematic sense. look, yeah. I think some, uh, some organizations have been working on developing sort of survey instruments to, to figure all of that out. I think generally the sort of barometer we've been using has been about the testing and the... Um, the field tests of the test, how did those go, the, is the technology in place to be able to take them, but that's, again, relatively sort of blunt look at whether states are, are, are implementing. Okay. All right, well, I wanna step aside. I, I have some break glass questions, but I anticipate you guys have your own good questions to ask, so if folks just wanna raise their hand and I'll call on you as you raise your hands. 
Aren't there any questions? There we go. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, what are your pet peeves yeah. when you read about the <laughs> Common Core? I imagine you guys have a few. Well, yeah. I might not be doing uh, myself, any, my, myself any favors right now, but I just heard you say it a moment ago, implementation. Um, ah. I, I think there's, <laughs> there's so much misrepresentation about where do standards play in this broader scope of things we need to do to fix the education system. Um, and I think if there's one thing that you can blame on uh, Common Core supporters, it's that. It's that Common Core supporters have totally overplayed their hand on uh, making it seem as though if you just have high standards, everything else will fall into place. I love bringing up the New York Times editorial board said, and I, this is not quite a direct quote, but close. They said, Common Core is undoubtedly the single most important education reform in our country's history. I think that's a little bit overstated. And so this idea that, you know, you just have these standards in place and then all of a sudden everything else is just going to work um, it is not the way to, to look at it, I think. Standards are essentially the goals that you're setting for your, uh, for your school system. It's the outcomes that you want to see achieved. And so uh, I think it's implementation is, in the first place, hard to measure because school systems are going to do a million different things to try to reach those goals. It's about do we believe we should set the goals high enough that students are going to be more or less ready to go to college or get a job afterwards. And certainly there can be reasonable disagreement about exactly what those goals need to look like. But there should be an understanding that you need to first set high goals. Uh, you're not going to achieve great things unless you set high goals in education or anything else. And then you need to work on uh, achieving those goals that are set by the state. And there are a million different ways to do that. I think a word uh, that has been abused and unfortunately has repeatedly been abused, and this is just its most recent thing, is uh, the word research. Um, so people love, <laughs> good, I'm glad I'm not the only one who noticed this, right? Right, so um, I, people are gonna disagree with me on this one and that's all right, but standard setting is essentially a subjective process, right? A lot of people like to talk about how there's research that goes into things, no. People get together, a, a lot of very bright people got together and decided this is what we think children should know. Some individual aspects of that are based on research, particular reading strategies, particular mathematics strategies. But broadly speaking, it's bright people getting together in a room, that ain't research, right? That's, that's a, it could be a democratic process, could be a lot of things. But uh, so I think that sometimes these things get that sort of dint of, of, of technocracy or sort of like this is exactly the way things are supposed to be. So um, I think, you know, Carol brought up the point of when you set sort of a cut score. Again, we, there is a way, I guess, conceivably where that could be done based on research where you sort of backwards map people's life outcomes and people who hit this particular score were more likely to be employed eight years out or whatever. But we don't, we've never done that. We don't necessarily have the data to be able to do stuff like that. Um, Again, it's small sort of experiments. things, But anyway, um, ultimately, it's a subjective process. Um, and so to say a lot of this stuff is research-based when it's actually just smart people getting together and saying stuff, it's not research. Carmel, you're chopping at the point. I mean, I just could not agree, disagree more. I mean, if you look at the process that was used in this context, it wasn't the act. It wasn't the activity of research, but it was absolutely research-based. The very smart people in the room, first of all, were brought in the room because they were most familiar with the research about what, were, what was the core set of knowledge and skills that students needed to be successful in college and career. And they absolutely looked at the research connected to that. Did they get every single standard exactly right? I'm sure they didn't because no research-based process is a perfect process. But the people who were assembled to develop the standards did look at the research that was the center of their focus, which actually historically has not been the case in standard setting in education, but was the case here. They, they, and they allowed for a tremendous amount of feedback. And when people brought feedback that had a research base behind it, they made changes. And you absolutely, in, in New York, when they cut the, when they set the cut scores, they brought a bunch of really smart people in a room from a lot of different perspectives, and they brought the research on the cut scores 
to the table. There's a tremendous amount of research around ACT and SAT in terms of what the scores your kids get mean in terms of their success in college, in in career, in jobs, in in income levels. Like there is actually a lot, a huge body of research around those things, and it's not perfect. Just like it's not perfect in any discipline, but they are in New York. They brought that to the table when they set the cut score, and then just generally speaking, the evidence. Carol said that harder isn't necessarily better in terms of education. There's a huge body of research that says that systems that have a lot of things, different components, but the a consistent component of high performing school systems, if you look globally, if you look at states, if you look at districts, if you look at school systems, it, that they have to start with a high set of standards. What we were doing before clearly wasn't working. 40% remediation rates. We have about 40% proficiency rates in NAEP. Whatever, whether that's about proficiency or about grade level, there, it seems to be commonly held that NAEP is a pretty accurate measure of proficiency. 40% of our kids, less than 40% of our kids are proficient in reading and math. Half of that for African Americans and Hispanics. So I think there's a huge amount of evidence that high standards matter and these standards were research-based. Sorry, I know that wasn't the question. Right. That's okay. okay. If I could respond, since some of it is directed at me. Um, the SAT says that 1,500 is the score, essentially, that indicates college readiness. Which, and even then, if you really look at the research on kids being college ready, it, the kid's GPA is a far better predictor than what a kid gets on the SAT, which is why a lot of schools are actually moving, a lot of colleges are moving away from the SAT. But it's essentially 1,500, three fives. New York used 1,630. That's the difference between 50% being college ready and 30% being college ready. If you look at the back of the Common Core and what is supposed to be the research base in the appendices, and you go through it and you read it, and I have, it's not real research. You know, a lot of people have spoken about this. The people who created the Common Core standards were all well-meaning people. There's good in it and there's bad in it. But to say that any of this is really grounded in research is incorrect. Now, for my least favorite word, that would be failure. Proficiency or not being proficient is often conflated with the word failure. So that, for example, we have screaming headlines in New York State, in some of the newspapers, especially around the New York City area, that say, how could it be that 98% or 95% of all of the teachers in New York State are, are effective if... 70% of the kids are failing the test, right? So this is the real world implications of setting proficiency rates at an inappropriate place and then conflating the idea of a student being proficient or not proficient with the idea of failure. Do you really see a lot of that in terms of headlines and, and you know copy not proficient versus failure you see absolutely failure it's part of, of Campbell Brown's lawsuit against tenure in New York right now I mean that's one of the points she makes how could we have this percent of teachers being uh, being rated effective if only 30 percent of the kids are passing the score so I mean that rhetoric is out there and it's clearly used by people who want to frame public schools and public school educators in a bad light. Any other questions? Yeah. What, I think a microphone's coming. Oh, out. yes. Has there been any talk about revising the standards themselves, and what would be the political reality of that or possibilities of that? Because there are certainly people who say, oh, so the standards could use a little tweaking, but it's not clear to me how and whether that would happen. Yeah, I mean, how impactful of a process can that be, especially since, you know, if a state, you know, repeals the standards or reviews them and makes tweaks and they make certain declarations about them, but they're very similar. 
What has so, been what can be accomplished? What so could, yeah. the state? I meant, just, just to clarify, I meant like not you know individual states reviewing or revising the standards, but like the consortium and the overall the common says, yeah. standards uh, that are on you know the website. The was Aspire website. Yeah. Sure. Achieve. Yeah. I I don't think there's any plan for the the collaboration of state leaders who created them to get back together to review them to make changes. But any first of all, the state can pick and choose among the standards as they see fit so they can revise their standards just under whatever legal process that state requires for revision. Um, they also can supplement the standards. The target was the, the collaboration of state leaders who developed them. They agreed that they would be striving for states to have 85% of the standards aligned. So there's, there's room to reject particular standards within the Common Core and to supplement them. Um, but any state can revise as they see fit. I guess the other thing that I would just point out is that in the translation from standards to curriculum to instructional practice, there's a huge amount of freedom to tweak in terms of emphasizing what a particular state or a particular district or even a particular school thinks is more or less important um, and, and to translate them differently um, to, to some with some degree so I think there's no current plan for a you know a national effort to revise the standards but there's lots of room for modification absent that no, I think I think that's a really important point so um, actually a couple years ago so Rick Hess and I did a book on the Common Core that came out last September I think we had Pat McGuinn as political scientist at Drew University write a whole chapter about governance in the Common Core um, who owns the standards, like kind of who, who oversees this process. And one of the interesting things that, that he brought up was this idea that there hasn't been a sort of governing body that says, you know, if we need to revise the standards in the future, we are the people who are going to do that. If we're going to sort of say, this test is actually aligned to the Common Core, but this one isn't. So like state X is using this test, it turns out it's not actually aligned to the standards the way that we envision it. And the problem is, <laughs> Uh, I don't think that body can exist because uh, it's sort of a catch-22, right? So if it the sort of is the play between states giving up their sort of ability to take over the standards, any body that is powerful enough to do that will be sort of rejected by the people in the states that are part of it. And any body that those people will accept will not have the power to do some of the things that folks want it to. So the individual state consortium might look over their tasks and say it, um, the individual states can work on their tests. But again, it kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning. If all of these states are doing their own things and doing their own tests, we just see that common part of the common core getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You're getting at attention that's partially because of politics, right? Because a, sort of a governing council, it's, it seems like a really politically fraught idea. Yeah, but if point. you think there, there are antecedents to this, so like NAGB that oversees NAEP, like there are these organizations that are, that are out there that are able to to oversee these processes, but I don't believe there was any appetite or any desire to do that related to the Common Core. But Mike, I think the difference there is that NAEP is a truly federal test, and it gets to the point that a lot of people have accused the Common Core of being this national mandate. It's, it's coming down um, from DC, and states don't have control over the standards. I, I think the, the simple fact that there is not some sort of revision committee, there's not some sort of entity that's ultimately going to be the decider on what these standards look like, proves that there is no uh, national mandate on this and that states do have control, and I think that's a good thing. You've seen uh, Florida, for example, which has added a lot to its high school math standards. You've seen other states that have found ways to make revisions within standards, which, by the way, I mean, as has been pointed out, they only needed to align 85% in the first place, and realistically, if states wanted to only align 75% instead of 85%. There's no common core police out there that's going to say, okay, you've, you've crossed the threshold of this no longer being common core and therefore something. I mean, there, there's no, there are no penalties there. There are no, um, uh, there, there's no enforcement on this. Certainly we want all states to have college and career ready standards, but states can go a very different direction. And I think as long as their higher education systems are on board, be okay. Carol, is there a Common Core SWAT team? <laughs> okay. 
I don't know that there's a Common Core SWAT team, but there is there is a policeman, and I believe he lives in this city, and he can enforce the Common Core through ESEA waivers and also race to the top. Um, the Common Core standards are copyrighted, and as far as the 85% go, you are allowed to add to. I do not know of any mechanism by which you are allowed to subtract or change and not put in jeopardy your ESEA waiver or your race to the top funding. I mean, if you look at the Florida Sunshine State standards, it's really very funny. I mean, I have examples. I'm not going to read them to you here. You do it yourself. Sit with the Common Core standards and sit with the Florida standards. You know, word for word for word. And then they threw in some stuff about penmanship and I guess something else and, um, at the, at in the high school level. That I'm not familiar with. But look what happened to Oklahoma. I mean, Oklahoma got itself in trouble. They went back to their standards, which actually were very good standards, which were rated exactly like the Common Core by Fordham. They went back to it. They got in trouble. They now got approved by higher education in the state of Oklahoma, so they're no longer in trouble anymore. Right? So to say that you can kind of just change it all and not have any penalties in terms of race to the top and ESCA, I don't think that that's the case. Well, yeah. It seems like there's a lot of interest in that, yeah. Yeah, well, first of all, Oklahoma has been approved for those standards. That they they were they they lost their waiver when they were in limbo, when they rejected the Common Core, and they did not they did not put forth another set of standards that were validated by their own post secondary system as college and career ready. Once that happened, their waiver was approved. So to say that that uh, Arnie Duncan is the police here is just wrong. That the standard that he has set is that it has to be college and career ready, and he's laid out a pathway that's an alternative to the Common Core. The Common Core is copyrighted, but states, it's, it's a license that allows states to pick and choose from the Common Core. It's just if they're going to call what they've adopted the Common Core, the, understandably, the authors of the Common Core wanted some integrity in that. So if you want to call it the Common Core, then you have to abide by the, the licensees, which are a bunch of state uh, chiefs. It's not the federal government, but states can pick and choose and still use the Common Core and many have. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the whole copyright thing is a total red herring, and it's it doesn't actually affect policy whatsoever. And I guess just to the point that if you know if states make changes, all of a sudden Arnie Duncan is going to come down on them. I, I think that's just completely false. Sure, Florida mostly added uh, to their standards rather than making revisions, but. What about Pennsylvania, which made significant changes as early as 2010 or 2011? What about Indiana? What about uh, Missouri, which is going through this process? South Carolina, which is going through this process? Uh, and on and on and on, uh, where there are states that have made sometimes minor changes, sometimes major changes, and have not had uh, the sky fall. So I, I just think that's completely false. It's very clear that states are not going to have the federal government coming down on them. Uh, as long as they can get their own higher education system to say, yeah, we'll we'll take these kids and they're not going to need remediation in our in our uh, universities. So, I, I think that seems fairly reasonable to me. I again would rather see the federal government have less of a footprint than more of a footprint on this or any other issue in education. But this idea that there's this Common Core police out there that's going to tell these states what to do is is just false. Other questions. Yeah, the best. Sort of following up on that, um, is it still politically possible just to do minor tweaks, or are we expecting in the next legislative sessions, sort of what's happening in Missouri, like major rewrites? Um, and how do you prevent the chaos if that's the case when there's the in between? Who wants that one? I mean, I don't think we're going to see a big wave of. Um, movement to radically change the standards. I think the reason that Florida mostly added to it is because they looked at it and they thought they were good standards. I mean, it was a pretty, it was a very rigorous research-based process to develop it. Um, so there's 44 states that adopted, six have, have, you know, stepped back from that adoption. Only three of them have repealed. Of the three, two of them essentially adopted the same thing and called it by another name. So I think, again, as I said in the beginning, I think we've sort of passed, 
it got, gotten over the high point in terms of controversy, <clears throat> and I think moving forward, there'll be continue to be controversy around tests, but I don't think we'll see big moves to undo the standards in many states. Yeah, and just to tack on, I don't know if, the, if you guys think the 2014 elections had any sort of, gave any sort of indication one way or the other about where this is headed. I know I was watching some state school chief races that maybe uh, were heartening for common core opponents, but I don't know how that plays in the larger context of things and what states actually decide to do in, in 2015. So that question or just where states are headed? Yeah, well, well, first briefly on, uh, on this question, I think there's an inverse relationship between the rhetoric around the Common Core and the actual changes that are being made to the Common Core in some of these states. I'm, I've seen reports of Louisiana is no longer in the Common Core because Bobby Jindal said so. Well, that's not true. They're still in the Common Core. They're still 100% in the Common Core. Missouri, certainly there's been a lot of rhetoric around this, but I don't know that we're going to see you know, drastic changes there. Um, and, and I think in Oklahoma, even the one state that did make significant changes just by going back to their old state standards, they're still going to have to develop a new set of standards. We had a big problem with that because uh, think of the chaos that's going to cause with teachers who are trying to have three different sets of standards in just a handful of years. But where, where they ultimately end up could end up being still pretty similar to the Common Core. Um, uh, on the politics, again, I, I think let's just be careful. Let's look at the rhetoric compared to the reality of this on the ground in terms of what changes are actually being uh, being made here. And I think realistically, there are a lot of people who maybe say very different things on the Common Core, maybe not, but really end up in a pretty similar place in terms of the actual reality of the policy. I think there'll probably be changes over time, and I feel a lot better now that I know that it's easier to make those changes than we've been led to believe in New York. Um, I think there'll be revisions, especially in terms of developmental readiness in the lower grades. I think that as time rolls out, what will happen is people will start to see some of the problems in the upper grades in mathematics in terms of preparation for calculus. So I think we'll start probably with the Common Core as a base, and then each state will tweak over time, some more dramatically than others. Regarding the elections, I, I don't know. You know, when you look back at what just happened, there were a couple of state superintendencies, Arizona being one of them, David Garcia lost. Was it because of the Common Core standards? Possibly it had an impact. I think it's going to tend to be issues in close races. I mean, even at the end of the governor's race in New York, um, Andrew Cuomo started running what looked like anti-Common Core ads at the very end. So um, there's going to, to have some effect on the next cycle of elections. Will it be the issue in the elections? No. I think the technical term for what he did with those ads was he went a bit wobbly, <laughs> uh, at least at least publicly. Uh, and, and, and one, As or, one or two Thatcher ads. would say, yes. yes. Mike, any last thoughts on that? Well, I mean, again, I, I I think part of that just comes back to being so. What we've heard kind of throughout this this conversation, like states have all this latitude to kind of do whatever they want and that they can do this, and there's no cop holding people down. But like, like you can't be a little bit pregnant. Right? Like you're either part of the Common Core or you aren't. And what does it mean? Like, what does it mean to be part of the Common Core? And so, again, it's sort of if states are able to essentially do something completely different than their neighboring state, yet still call it the Common Core, like, are they still doing the same thing? And that's to me the real, we've heard a lot about separating rhetoric from reality. That's to me the, the real tension there, right? So like, what are states actually doing and calling it the Common Core? And is it in fact a common enterprise? What are states doing? That's probably a good way to end it, actually, <laughs> um, and move on to our next panel. Um, so I want to thank you guys thank for you. stopping by and, and taking questions and, and talking about it. Thank you. It was really